And so treatment-wise, if you're coming to work through your strategies with our team, what we talk about is a whole person management approach, which is a broad approach, a holistic thing, where it is possible to use some medical parts of that approach, but broadly we're trying to move from a focus on that to the other four fingers. So the, the mind, body, the way that our thoughts and emotions link to physical state, connection um, to other people, to the environment, to purpose, activity and nutrition. So we look, as we go around the whole person approach, at five different aspects to that. It does include our traditional medical treatments, but they are not the main game, in fact. And it's the other aspects, the other four fingers that have greater power to retrain the nervous system and reduce pain. So this finger is about the mind-body connection, the interweaving of our thoughts and our emotions, our beliefs, and what's happening for us physically. The next finger is about connection, and this is connection to other people. It's about connection to the environment around us. It's about connection to a life purpose as well. And then next finger is about activity, particularly physical activity, and finally nutrition. And the whole person approach is very much the interweaving of all these things. How do we look at how any of them can contribute to pain on one hand, and on the other hand, how do we use change in any of those areas to address treatment of chronic pain. One of the important things about the whole person approach or one of the things that makes it work much better if, is if it's driven by the person with the pain rather than driven by the doctor or other health professionals telling them what to do. So really this seems you know, perhaps the most important part of it and when we look at the five fingers there are multiple choices there. You start with maybe one finger or perhaps two and you can broaden out later but the important thing is for you to decide what feels right, what choices would you like to make, what areas would you particularly like to tackle now. I think the first section of the pain management um, course when I came and they talked about um, it wasn't just about managing pain in itself as pain but there was all different avenues um, that you need to work on like the social side of things, your interaction with people, um, the fact how your brain actually perceives the pain. And to me, I associate with the thinking side of things a lot more. So I was able to think, well, if I can put this plan in place, there's going to be hope that my life will be a lot more manageable and maybe back to something that it used to be to some degree. I don't think medication's going to help me at all. So. I really need something else. Many people with long-term pain don't feel believed and get trapped in a never-ending loop of suffering. Changing direction brings hope. New ideas have revolutionised pain thinking and care. The focus is more on the whole person and less on the body structures. Persistent pain can change. It's not always an enduring disease or problem. First getting assessed and ruling out anything dangerous is important. Then it's time to shift focus, get informed and manage pain from a broad, active perspective. Next, everyone can benefit from making the mind-body link. Drawing a timeline helps make sense of the emotional impact of life events before during and after the onset of pain. Addressing underlying depression or anxiety early is critical to reducing pain over time. People also say they feel isolated. Reconnecting to life makes a real difference. Finding new purpose and positive ongoing support benefits the recovery process. Sleep, rest and physical activity habits all impact on function. Taking practical steps toward improving sleep, limiting rest, and establishing regular activity helps. In time, confidence builds. And trusting that the body's rhythms and limits can change brings a renewed sense of well-being. Last, good nutrition can't be ignored. Optimising our diets with plenty of natural food lets healthy gut bacteria thrive 
and brings less inflammation and pain. This is not just New Age thinking. These discoveries have shifted the world's understanding of how best to treat pain. Decreasing pain starts with knowing about pain and choosing to work on sustainable strategies. Knowledge about pain now and less pain in the future? Now that's a reward worth working for. The first part of the whole person approach is the, the thumb, which is the biomedical section. And there are really three main areas within the medical treatments. There's surgery, there are nerve blocks and medication. From a surgical perspective, it's not necessarily commonly helpful in long-term pain, but there are certainly some examples where an operation can help. And perhaps the best example might be someone having a hip replacement for pain in the hip area that's associated with osteoarthritis. So for some people with chronic pain, there is a simple surgical solution like that. But if you look at the whole population of people with chronic pain, really it would only be about 5% or one in 20 of those people with chronic pain where there is a simple surgical solution. The second type of medical treatments are nerve blocks and other injections. So these are sometimes very effective, particularly in the short term. It is possible using different injection techniques to maybe even completely get rid of pain for a short period of time. But that's just the issue. It may only last for that short period of time. And it depends what type of injection is used, how long the benefits might last. But really the issue is that if nothing else is done, if it is only this injection approach, then by the time the block wears off, the person is no further ahead. The third part of the medical approach is using medication. And again, it's a little bit like the situation with the nerve blocks. Medication can work very effectively in the short term, but they run out of legs over the longer term. A little bit more on the opioids, because as I say, we um, got this wrong medically. I'm quite conscious of that. We made um, unhelpful recommendations, not deliberately, just so we didn't have the right information, but we made wrong recommendations over the last five or 10 years or so. So what to do about that now? Um, our approach with the, the OxyContin, the morphine group, is to get people off that these days. We can do this very slowly. Um, but really what we're trying to do is to work with you and support you and your GP for as long as is necessary to wean that medication down and get you off that. The reason why we're so keen on that is because of the science saying too much harm and not enough benefit. We can sometimes do this very slowly. Um, I was working with a lady the other day and we came up with a plan to gradually, she was on a big dose of OxyContin, we came up with a plan to drop it down very slowly, in fact, over three years. So we were coming down a notch each month to get her off in three years time. We did that over a long frame, time frame for her because she was quite fearful of the process. Um, some people we can do it much more quickly. Some people we can get them off over a few months. So it's very individually variable, but we're finding with all these people who come off that either their pain is no worse or their pain is a bit better as they come down and off the medication. So it can be difficult coming down off medication and transitioning from the one way of doing things to the other, but keeping a good link with your GP, keep talking the issues through with them is important. And then beyond that also, there are other health professionals and family and friends who may be good resources to you at this time as well. I, I, I think that the, the painkillers and the, uh, the, um, uh, the anti-inflammatories and all that, that I was, there's no doubt that they're having a detrimental effect on, on your organs. And I, I, I want to die of a bad back, as I said before, not of kidney failure. So, I, and by doing, by getting into these programs and exercising, and uh, it enabled me, I'm, I'm sure, to cut down on that on that sort of stuff. Well, I I don't actually take um, medication for the actual pain um, that's in my mouth. It's more for the um, anxiety that's associated with it because. 
at the, in this present day, they haven't really found um, something that can re relieve that pain. So with the anxiety medication, yeah, there is antidepressant medication. There is a lot of feeling in a fuzz and, um, you know, there's lots of side effects that associated with it. And the one for sleep, which was supposed to calm down a little bit during the day, it makes you feel like you haven't, even though you might be snoring all night long, you haven't really had much of a sleep when you wake up. And, um, yeah, I don't want to stay in the path of, you know, sleeping till half past eight in the day and feeling tired um, when you wake up. So, I, yeah, I think it's a good move. I think for anyone who's been in chronic pain, it's a pretty much universal experience that you go through a system which really focuses on the body. But we know that in reality, what can be experienced in the mind, for example, strong emotions, can actually amplify or contribute to physical symptoms, including pain. And of course, we know that when people are you know, in a lot of pain, it can have emotional effects too, and can contribute to depression and sadness, anger and frustration. We see that quite commonly. And in fact, that's how we really should look at chronic pain from a holistic perspective. When the brain makes an interpretation of pain, the intensity of that pain varies a lot according to whatever is happening in the surrounding situation. So for example, if a concert violinist injures a finger, then that will have huge implications potentially for their career and their ability to perform at the concert that's coming up. And so in that situation of fear and anxiety, that will generally mean a much greater pain intensity. On the other hand, if someone who is working as a gardener injures a finger, then they may be much, much less stressed about that situation and the pain intensity stays lower. So the injury for the violinist may well be wrapped around high pain intensity and a lot of fear about moving potentially through that recovery phase. On the other hand, the gardener with the same injury is not too concerned about that and will probably be able to make an early return to usual activities and move much more smoothly and less fearfully through the recovery process. Um, well, I had um, I had three children and I had a fourth child um, and I had had a lot of time off work and I went back to work um, early, um, you know, than I had with the other children so that I could have longer time off with my fourth child over a period of time because I was a teacher and you could only have so much leave. And I, at the time I moved to a new school, um, the principal was a bit overpowering and demanding, not just to me but to the whole staff and, um, yeah, me being trying to be brave and push through it all, eventually it came to you know, a climax where my body said I couldn't deal with it any longer. So, and that's where it all started, you know, that the tablets came and then the mouth issue came too. The, 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 the knowledge um, that's dispensed and, and, and taught here is that it's not just the pain that maybe different people's stories has an impact on that pain at that particular time. And Obviously, if you can accept that's that part of the story and, and do, if there is an issue, deal with it. Um, you know, there's been evidence that the pain can be um, relieved or lowered in some way. And yeah, that's something I believe in. Um, so it's just a matter of looking at it again and seeing what you think has had an impact around that time when your pain um, came upon. It's a huge amount of stress because I was divorced in 1995-1996. Yes. Diagnosed with the arthritis in 1997-98. Okay, well that's... That's really, that's, you know, and, yeah. and I'd, I'd recognised that yeah, and yeah, saw yeah. that, you know, yes. just the stresses involved. Uh, 
is common. That, that story is common. One of the challenges is how you can identify that and then use that treatment wise. So one of the resources we've got on our website is a mind body workbook that allows you to sort of go back and sort of track through that. That's one of the treatment suggestions here. I don't, I sort of try and lead a fairly stress-free life now. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't tend to let things worry me like, like, like they used to. Like when I first hurt me back, I, I started getting depressed because I thought, you know, how am I gonna, I'm gonna get by? How am I, you know, gonna survive? And that used to stress me out. I, I ended up on antidepressants because, you know, it was, it was getting me down. I've realised now that things, things move on, you, you're going to survive anyway. And so I've, tend, I've tended not to, to let them sort of things worry me too much anymore. I wish I didn't have a sore back, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy enough with just the way, I don't, I don't tend to let things get on top of me anymore. So you've just got to accept it and, and get on with, with doing what you're going to do and make the best of a, of a bad lot. So it's not inevitable, but it's really common that when people are in chronic pain, you can get really quite depressed. When someone's quite depressed, you're not very motivated. You're much less likely to do things that can be helpful to manage pain effectively. It's really important, and it's what the research shows, that unless depression is treated effectively, chronic pain treatment is really difficult. So of course it's really important that if you have depression, that your depression is treated effectively? Obviously the way someone feels um, and the way they respond to pain is going to be affected by their environment in, in which they've put themselves in and, and their emotional um, position in, at the time. You know, I think one of the things that's come out of this, you need to be in um, a, a good space with people around you and and trying to uh, motivate yourself to enjoy life um, and from that I think it just grows um, and whether the pain actually lowers or disappears I think it might my belief and hope is that it becomes irrelevant and that you can um, move on regardless and still get back into that same routine as what you used to be before the pain. So as human beings, we're social creatures, aren't we? It's really important for all of us to feel connection with other people and with places. Um, if someone is much more isolated or perhaps lonely, they're much more likely to get quite depressed or down. And in situations like that, the experience of pain can be much worse. It's interesting that some recent research has actually shown that um, if someone is much more socially isolated or excluded, the same brain areas light up when someone's actually experiencing physical pain. So if we're able to surround ourselves with people who value us and make us feel understood and accepted and treat us from a whole person perspective, then the outcomes tend to be better. Friends can be important. It's really what you bring upon yourself. Like to me, I want to be isolated so you probably need someone to be a bit more um, domineering and saying well you know I'm not going to leave you alone and you're going to come and do this with me. Uh, I think a common theme here um, with the group is that a lot of people have become disconnected um, with their friendship groups because um, you're not available as much as you used to be and um, people move on and, and do different things and they, I guess they get sick of ringing and saying do you want to do something and you become a little bit unreliable. So you do need to have um, a good support there so you don't become too isolated. That's where, that's where exercising and, and that comes, in, comes into it and coming here and with all your uh, friends and, that come here and you, and you talk and instead of just thinking about your problems, it takes your mind off them, plus it gets you out and just sitting around home and um, gets you away from the wife and gives her a break too. Uh, yeah, it, it, 
it all it all it all helps to yeah if, if you if you just sit around thinking about your soul back all the time you'll get yeah you'll get really really depressed about things because you you I, I got i got a little bit depressed about it and and yeah it and then i started you know like this this exercise program and um, it, it does it, it it helps you got to keep sort of moving One of the big uh, factors for pain management for people is that they often become inactive when they've got pain for a long time. So we work on a whole range of active skills and physical activity is one of them. Uh, and that can take whatever form that people want. So whether that's riding your bike or swimming or walking, it doesn't matter, but it is about having a look at where you're at at the moment and coming to terms with what that level is. And we do a bit of exploring around that if you actually come to the clinic. And then once you've got that level set, and we set a goal around that activity, and then we usually slowly upgrade that to the level that you want it to be. It's quite exciting really, because people often think that, they, that pain is going to be worse when they exercise, and yet the opposite's true. So exercise is actually something that, it's a big word, it's called hypoalgesic, it actually makes the pain go down. But that's quite frightening and it's a big jump for people to make in their mind that actually they can be active again after often quite a considerable period where they haven't moved very much. We are all different. Uh, in fact, some people do so much activity that they end up flaring up their pain in a major, major way. And often then the next day they need to have a lie down and a and a rest. So for the people that are at what we might call overdoers or they might call themselves overdoers, they have to have a look at their activity patterns and really start to put the brakes on and, and divide it up a little bit more and find an activity pattern that means that they don't have those boom bust kind of cycles. So that's one extreme. The other extreme are the people that, that might be resting too much and by resting too much, we'd actually say probably anything more than about 45 minutes a day of lying down is too much. So we do quite a bit of assessing around that. And people um, really have to come to grips with how many hours a day they're lying down. And sometimes that's an hour or two hours, but it can be five hours or 10 hours a day. And for those people, uh, they have to slowly work on bringing those activity levels up bit by bit by bit. And we here at the clinic would help people support people with doing that or people at home can do that themselves uh, and it's nice to see people go from not being able to move very much or frightened to move and then bit by bit really getting that back and getting some sort of restoration of normal physical activity and function. And any I find when I'm exercising um, you know you, you, you feel better straight away you know um, as far as here and the contact with the people here yeah, that contributes a lot, you know, probably, probably uh, we come here early in the morning, so virtually at the start of the day, we get an exercise program that we can stick to um, and can be revised every now and again, like um, if things change, um, but it's, yeah, you know, I think it's, it's the way to go, you know, you've got to, you can't stop moving. You can't go bullet to gate, you can't lift big weights, but you, everyone can have a program um, that'll suit them. And the worst thing you can do is stop moving. You, the more exercise you do, the, the, the better it's going to turn out with weight. And when I first come here, I had trouble walking on the walker for probably more than 10 minutes, you know. Um, but over the, the, the time, I've slowly built myself up to well, I can walk 7Ks now. I'm probably not the quickest, but yeah. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's had a, a marked effect on, on, on managing, yeah, the pain levels. Yeah, keeping a little bit thinner, exercising. It's, it's all, all good. Well, certain types of food cause your nervous system to become more sensitised and there's a couple of 
reasons for this, but probably the most important and the one we're just finding more and more out about is that weight is associated with metaflammation. Metaflammation is a chronic low-grade inflammation of your system and fat cells will contribute to that. Diets high in sugar, high in the wrong kind of fat. Um, our westernised type of diet, it causes this low-grade inflammation and inflammation in itself will cause pain. And there's also a lot of nasty cells released with inflammation, which are chemical drivers of pain. So our diet has changed radically in the last 100 years or so. We're eating a lot more cereal and um, the types of food are different. We're eating less fish, we, we're not getting as much omega-3. Um, so our balance of fats has changed. If we were eating from all of the food groups and really tr looking, focusing on having a rainbow of colours, especially with our vegetables, we would be having quite a comprehensive diet. Uh, one of the really key things to remember is five and two, which is five servings of veggies and two servings of fruit a day. And if you find that you're not able to get all the right balance from your normal diet, you may even want to include some supplements. That might be fish oil um, or some kind of omega-3 substitute, so fish oil or flaxseed oil. Yeah, well, caffeine is probably the most consumed drug in the world and it can give you a bit of a pick-me-up. So a lot of people who have pain, chronic pain, or who have low mood like to have a coffee to pick them up. But caffeine, which is in coffee, tea, chocolate, energy drinks, and a whole range of other things that sometimes you wouldn't even realise, what it does is it winds or sensitises your nervous system again. It is a stimulant, it puts you on high alert and that's often what we like about it, but it certainly can add to chronic pain. Just because you have chronic pain doesn't mean you have to throw out all the good things in life. If you have a well-balanced diet, you eat from the five food groups, you eat a rainbow of colours, you can still have some nice treats, you can have some dark chocolate, an occasional wine, have a coffee in the morning and it will make a difference to your pain.